एवरीवन इन द फैमिली यस 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 यू नो सम टाइम्स ये जो हमारे थे रजिस्ट्रार पहले थे पंजाब यूनिवर्सिटी के करण जी जी ये इनके भाई साहब सब बन गए बस मालूम होगा आपको यू मस्ट बी अवेयर कौन कौन करण करण जी जो पहले रजिस्ट्रार थे पंजाब यूनिवर्सिटी के हां दैट्स राइट दैट्स राइट लास्ट टू लास्ट वीक उनके बेटे की शादी थी ओके ओके देखिए आप तो जैसे कहते हैं ना मैथमेटिक्स यू आर नॉट व्हिच इज स्क्वायर लेट्स टॉक अबाउट टू और थ्री डॉक्टर ग्रोवर का भी लेक्चर नहीं अटेंड कर पाया यूनिवर्सिटी बहुत अच्छा लेक्चर था उनका हां यस मुझे दुबा साहब ने बताया अच्छा लेक्चर था आप लोग सब बहुत हाईली रिसर्च रिसर्च करके आप लोग लेक्चर देते हैं तो आज का टॉपिक भी बहुत इंटरेस्टिंग है दैट्स राइट एक्चुअली यू सी इट इज लाइक दिस बिहाइंड द सक्सेस ऑफ आर्मी जनरल देयर आर लैक्स ऑफ सोल्जर्स बिहाइंड द सोल्जर्स हु एक्चुअली ब्रेक द आर्मी टू फाइट एट द बॉर्डर यस राइट बिहाइंड द टॉप साइंटिस्ट देयर इज एन आर्मी ऑफ younger ones of all ages scientific community even some are known some are not known that's right less known or not known because uh, whatsoever we are doing today that is on mm-hmm. account of what we gathered from uh, behind you know our fourth father whatsoever we are able to do it uh, you know yeah. the addition we had not invented the bulb we would not have been able to you know work kai baar sochta hu ki hamare jo purush the उन्होंने कितनी डिफिकल्टी से साइंस की होगी बिल्कुल उस समय तो कुछ भी प्रकाश नॉट इवन मच ऑफ कम्युनिकेशन यस कम्युनिकेशन भी थी और हम मुझे याद है व्हाट वी यूज्ड टू डू वी यूज्ड टू रिमूव द जो स्टैंप्स होती है ना पोस्टल स्टैंप्स उस पे स्टैंप कर देते हैं कोई बच जाती है किसी पे स्टैंप नहीं होती तो हम उतार लेते थे बस को उतार कर और छेर पे लगते थे फॉर यू नो इन बिल्कुल रिप्लेस मंगवाने के लिए छेद पे लगते थे एयर एयर मेल के <laughs> हम तो वो ऑनवेलप जिसमें ए4 पेपर भेजा करते थे वो भी नहीं यूज कर चुके हैं यस यस नहीं उसमें दो यूज इट वाज वेरी इंटरेस्टिंग पर मैं ये सोचता हूं कि आजकल की जो जनरेशन है दे आर सो गुड वेल इंफॉर्म्ड एंड दे आर सो गुड इवन इन साइंस तो आजकल द the unemployment is, has been so much ye un bicharon ki jo inputs hain wo kar nahi pate aage i am not taking into account those uh, who plagiarize wo bhi aajkal bahut hain because of this uh, good communication ha because of, of availability of a lot of people. but some are really good is professor grover joining us i don't see him on screen because it is past 11 Yeah, yeah, I think I I, I should call him up and find out. Yeah, would you like? Mahipal calling. Mahipal is already calling. Okay. Because normally he is there on. No, no, no. Yes, normally he is there. Yes. आप चिंता ना करूं हाँ देखे ग्लोबल Professor Grover has joined. Yeah, yeah. I don't know why it started to give me a program. But uh, but we can see you. We can hear you. Yeah. Hello. Yeah. No, it is better. It suddenly started to install updates. <laughs> 
ये सभी के साथ प्रॉब्लम है ग्रोह साहब इट इज समाइम यू ओपन even your uh, mobile there is some or was some... it is not even allowing me to leave that uh, in updates <laughs> <laughs> abhi aapki photo aa rahi hai ja rahi hai Let me just then put the video off. Oh, now it's okay now. Is this better now? Yes, perfect. Yeah, I'm here. <coughs> Hello, can you hear me, Kya? Yes, yes, yes. Yes, yes, we can hear you. loud and sorry. clear uh, sorry then we can start now yeah please go ahead apologies for delaying the things but anyway good morning all of you it's indeed my privilege to welcome all of you to this year's national science day lecture on behalf of society for promotion of science and technology in india the chandigarh chapters of national academy of sciences of india the indian national science academy and uh, indian indian uh, national young academy of sciences nas our speaker today is a national icon professor l s shashidara the director national center for biological sciences a constituent of tata institute of fundamental research located in bangalore national science day is typically commemorated on february 28 or february 29 every year The National Science Day is, is an event which the SPSTI has commemorated ever since its inception in 2009. It has been celebrated uninterrupted. Prior to the pandemic, SPSTI public lectures were hosted in physical form in a school or a college or a university department or a national institution located in Chandigarh or Haryana. The pandemic brought in the notion of online lectures. the spa thus hosted the national science day lectures during the last two years in online mode in partnership with the chandigarh chapters of science academies and enias on a saturday immediately after february 28 because the day had to be convenient for everyone so the president of spsta mr dharamveer wanted to go back to the practice of hosting science day lectures in physical form from this year so hosting a lecture on a working day as i said is in is inconvenient for the members of the science academies as well as the young members of inias who have their teaching duties so we decided to host two lectures to commemorate the national science day this year one in the physical form and the other in the online mode so at dharamveer's this request i gave the lecture in the physical form on march 1 and that was titled on uh, raman effect and a nobel prize awarded to him the theme of national science day this year as prescribed by government of india is global science for global wellbeing to speak on such a theme we decided to invite a national icon who is engaged in progressing the theme in a proactive manner so professor shashidara is aptly suited for this honor and we are lucky that he readily accepted our request to speak on our platform today so thank you shashi I have had the good fortune of interacting with you on several platforms in addition to serving on the committees of Indian Academy of Sciences Bangalore you had contacted us as you along with Professor Kimbavi proposed the creation of Pune Knowledge Cluster 4 years ago our audience will remember a brilliant lecture delivered by Professor Kimbavi also on our platform just a few weeks ago Professor Shashi is also a, has also been a very active part of the delhi cluster drive floated by iit delhi and you and i have served on attended several meetings of the drive together while i presided over the review and advisory committee of drive the director ncbs professor shashidara today has an opportunity to take the life sciences research in india to yet another higher platform 
the 21st century is indeed the century of uh, life sciences. A global competitor of the IFR in research is Weizmann Institute of Science in Israel. Two thirds of Weizmann Institute of Science today is engaged in life sciences. And there is a whole lot of life science related industry which has come on, come about around the Rio campus of Weizmann Institute. So NCBS has had collaboration with Weizmann Institute for some years. NCBS today has on its campus the DB Institute for Stem Soil, Stem Science Research, as well as Center for Cellular and Molecular Platform, CC Camp, and the newly created Tata Institute of Genetics and Society. The Bangalore Life Sciences Cluster, together with the parent Department of Biological Sciences at Bangalore, and the Life Sciences Initiatives being pursued at the TIFR Hyderabad campus. The theme of TIFR Hyderabad campus also is, is light, life, and matter. So two thirds of Hyderabad campus is also engaged in life sciences. Uh, so I am personally looking forward to Shashi providing leadership to all these entities and bridge the gap between the Weizmann Institute of Science and the TIFR during his tenure as the director of NCBS. And you can do it because you enjoy a long association with NCBS and with Vijay Raghavan, with whom you had worked in the beginning of your career as a postdoc, is still there at NCBS. Was a Balram from IIC is also at NCBS as a chair professor. So you have the strength, you have the experience, and you have the support of the TIFR, the DAE, the DBT, and the DST to lead this national in initiative and make India proud. So welcome to our platform and we are Thank looking you. forward to, to your title, <clears throat> which to your lecture, which you have very aptly uh, titled as Less Known Success Stories of Indian Science Transforming Idea, uh, India. So please add to more such <laughs> stories and let the Indian scientists feel proud of the work that is being done. So now may I invite uh, Professor Rajat Sandhi to formally introduce Professor Keshigara for all of us. Well, you already had a very long introduction. I maybe <laughs> Professor, Professor well, Sandhi. Good, good morning all. My life has been made easier by Dr. Uh, Arun Grover. He's already given some insights about Professor uh, Shashidhara. So I will still formally introduce him. And I would say he is a visionary scientist who has contributed a lot in terms of molecular biology. His contributions are in science communication, policy making. So I will just take you over the journey of his career. He was a trained ag uh, agriculture scientist. So he did his B UG B uh, and post graduation in agriculture sciences from University of Agriculture Sciences, Harvard, and did PhD from University of Cambridge in chlorophyll biosynthesis. So after he came back to India, he joined Dr. Vijay Raghavan's lab in 1997. And for two years, he switched over to work on Drosophila fruit fly, which he formerly called. And he had made contributions in understanding the role of Hox genes, which are embryonic development genes, which play an important role in uh, limb development in Drosophila. And he also had contributions in the area of uh, cancer biology using Drosophila as a model system. And he particularly looked at the uh, role of uh, this APC gene in colon cancer, and which has been think, thought of as a target for cancer therapeutics. Interestingly, uh, uh, he worked for a uh, number of years at CCMB and continued to work in the area of this Drosophila, skin cancer, biology, and th things like that. And he had a great contributions in developing Indian Institute of uh, uh, Science, Education and Research, Pune, from which he built from scratch. And he's been a decorated scientist, got a technology award of CSAR in 2003, then SS Bhatnagar award in 2008 in the area of biological sciences, outstanding research uh, investigator award from DAE in 2006, and Jesse Bose Fellows, and he has been a fellow of all three academies. And 
there is an organization called European Molecular Biology, uh, EMBO, European Molecular Biology Organization. He is an associate member of that. And I would say he has been the first elected president of International Union of Biological Sciences, which has, for the first time in 100 years history of uh, this IU, uh, IUBS, and he's the first president from India. And I would say, I said he's been involved in policy making and he has contributed in developing of uh, uh, several teaching teacher related programs and uh, his programs which have been successfully implemented have trained something like 10,000 school and undergraduate teachers, which is an immense contributions towards science. And I have I learned that he has a strong uh, intent of connecting science and taking it to translational. And he believes the science has to be uh, multidisciplinary, multi-institutional, and then only the benefit to society can help. So I was reading uh, Dr. Uh, his predecessor's uh, his interview, and he said he's the one who can connect science to society. And I think he brings in a flavor of what uh, his predecessor from C uh, NCBS has uh, said about him. And uh, I would say, talking about him, his contributions are enormous. So I think the four or five minutes are not enough to talk about uh, his contributions in science, in society policy making as a science communicator. And I would say I'm too small to even introduce him. So I, I would say with these words, we look forward to his talk. Thank you, sir. So, Professor Shashi, then our platform is yours. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Grover, and, and for uh, you know, Rajat for, for a you know, kind introduction. Um, you know, uh, sometimes it's embarrassing to hear <laughs> so much about myself. Anyway, uh, so today, uh, uh, this is part of the National Science Day, although it's March 4th now, but it's celebrating still the 20th February event. And you know, we always try to celebrate uh, very different birthdays of personalities because we want to learn. We don't want to forget the lessons that we learn from them, their work. And it's not simply recognition of them. It's more about learning from them what we can do in our lifetime. For example, Gandhiji's birthday every year we celebrate on, on, on October 2nd. It's not simply you know, recognizing his contribution to society for the freedom struggle is more than that. He is to learn from his life what is that we can do now in this, in our own life. And interestingly, the National Science Day was not, many, many young students may think that it's the Raman's birthday, which is always they think that it is not Raman's birthday. It is the day on which he, he made this phenomenal discovery of what is now called Raman effect, right? And it has led to several applications. It took much longer time to have that application. This is something which is today's topic is how the science and technology are connected and how uh, the basic science uh, leads to uh, you know, more sustainable technology, some in very interesting new applications. And this earlier days, the way science was practiced and progressed, uh, it used to take much longer time. Perhaps now it wouldn't take much longer time. It could be within five to 10 years time scale. I'll come to that few uh, of those examples too. And, and, the, and, and the National Science Day is, it's of course to recognize the, the contribution of, uh, you know, our own uh, uh, you know, uh, Indian uh, Sir Sivi Raman to, uh, you know, the, the science of the world. Uh, it's also about the process of science. It is celebration of science itself, right? And not necessarily a, a breakthrough scientific discovery. Because the process of science is what we all need to first follow. The breakthroughs may come, you know, five years, one, in 10 years, or in once in a lifetime, or it may not come what we consider as breakthrough, uh, may not be considered as breakthrough with, with uh, you know, 10 years or 20 years or our, our lifetime. It's simply because science progresses in a multiple different ways. And what we consider breakthrough may not be the breakthrough uh, 10, 15 years later, as far as knowledge is concerned. But that should not deter us following rigorously the process of science, the scientific methodology. It has multiple, you know, interesting uh, benefits. One of them is, of course, 
more tangible benefit for for our own living livelihood health you know and, and so forth right and and equity in the society and so forth the second benefit is also our thinking process will change we'll become much more uh, you know unbiased and we have become more adaptable in the society and what we call scientific temperament uh, which improves the way uh, uh, you know uh, we live in the society and, and and improve the harmony in the society so celebrating science understanding the science, the process of science scientific methodology is very important now very often comes that it's too philosophical to say that you know we should follow this 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 and you know develop scientific temperament uh, in, in the society as a whole. That's where we always talk about more tangible, immediate benefit of science, and that's why we say why science should be pursued. Then they come, check comes. Okay, perhaps a few scientists sitting in research institutions or in the universities. Anyway, they're doing science. Why general public has to worry about science, right? And so that's when we need to really look at the you know, science as a social endeavor for the entire society uh, has to be part of the scientific discoveries and, uh, and, and the process of science. But at the same time, some may be more direct taking the leading role and some perhaps more indirect and taking the slightly a back seat, but still supporting science. And finally, all of us are also, you know, as a human being, as in, as in addition to playing sovereign roles in the society, we also play a role as a mentor to our own children. It could be my own, you know, children, or it could be, you know, in the family circle, or it could be in the larger circle. We also mentor directly or indirectly all the younger generation. And if I am somewhat well knowledge, better knowledgeable and have better understanding of the process of science and importance of science in the society, I will also encourage those children also to follow those ones, right? And that's also important that every citizen should be aware of the importance of science in the society, right? So, and because the tendency is to sort of you know, look at the science as those scientists like Einstein or Raman or uh, Jagdish Chandra Bose and whatever the work they did, uh, which led to, uh, you know, major recognition, although unfortunately Jagdish Chandra Bose didn't have the same level of recognition that uh, others had, including the Nobel Prize, but doesn't matter. But they, Jagdish Chandra Bose is as, you know, household name as and many other scientists in this country, whether the Nobel Prize or not. But not necessarily that those are the only role models uh, uh, of scientists for the society. It could be in your own backyard, it could be in your own neighborhood. There may be a scientist who are working so hard to contributing to the society, you may not recognize. And recognizing those people also important. That's the only way that large number of people will practice uh, in, in you know taking up um, you know uh, science of the profession or support science directly or indirectly as a citizen uh, of, the, of the world, not necessarily uh, of a nation. Finally, uh, science is global. Uh, science is uh, universal. And there is nothing like Indian science and American science, European science. But, the, but, the, but the, the benefit of science sometimes can be local. Uh, it may benefit more you know, people in the certain local. You know, regions. More importantly, the way uh, the very different problems are manifested, whether it's health or uh, climate change related problem or environment problem, they are manifested differently in different parts of the world. So while science is global, the knowledge is universal, the solutions, which is science derived, evidence based solutions would be somewhat local. So that's something which I'll talk about very quickly. So what I'll do is I'll take you through uh, a few stories here. And these stories are, you know, some of them are published, some of them are there in, the, in literature, but you have to search. It is not very obvious uh, for you. Uh, and um, can you see my screen, all of you? Can someone mention that? Not yet, not, not yet. yet. Not yet. You can't see? Okay. Let me see.
Okay. Yeah, now it is coming. Okay. We have. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Now, now, now we have full screen. Yeah. Now. Yeah. Okay. So I deliberately uh, wanted to talk about less known stories because these are not the stories that uh, you know you would read in your textbook or uh, if you do a Google search. Of, these are the not the names which obviously come to um, you know uh, on your screen uh, even when you are searching something. Many times we come to know about science simply because someone else is talking about it or someone you know we read it in a textbook. Uh, but these are all fantastic stories, very very exciting ones and sort of makes all of us feel that you know, we are proud to be set part of such a community, scientific community, and uh, you know more and more people should participate in this process. <clears throat> so just to give you a, some background because we are talking about the science that is done in India, although science is global and universal I mentioned, uh, but still we are talking about the way science is practiced in India and under very, very constrained situation. So it's also important where we come from, right, as a society. Uh, as you know, India is a melting pot of cultures and genetic diversity and so forth. A very, very peculiar peninsular geography helps, you know, people of variety of different uh, uh, backgrounds to work and live together. And India is also the one of the first, you know, in the historical, uh, whatever the documents available, to have formal education. When I say formal education is where there is clearly a transfer of knowledge from one generation to another generation in a very systematic way with the help of professional, dedicated teachers. Typically, knowledge can be always transferred from parents to offspring or from the, you know, people who are living in a smaller groups. It happens even today in tribal population where there is no formal schooling system, but still they learn from from elders, you know, very different sounds birds make or what is the meaning of those sounds and so forth or which plant is useful for food, which plant is useful for medicine and so forth. But a formal education where the, the knowledge that is accumulated over time is systematically in a very structured way to transfer to the next generation, also to make, to improvise the knowledge, the process of improvisation of knowledge itself also taught as part of the uh, education. It's actually documentary history says that perhaps India is the first one. If not, it, it could be one of the very first ones, but my feeling is it could be even the very first one. And the reason this is also, uh, you know, that we, India has certain kind of strengths and expertise in certain areas of, um, you know, inquiry is because of this kind of a background. It's built over three to 4,000 years, at least, that we are good in logic and philosophy, good in mathematics, right? And uh, obviously, all you know about number system, algebra, and, and other mathematical aspect, and then inquiry and argumentation. And uh, in those who have read uh, Amatya's book about in argumentative India, it's not necessarily about the fun part of argumentation. It's also the you know the the the, the scientific inquiry, which is through argumentation, right? Uh, so these are all the strengths of of India. Um, you know, even before. Uh, you know, British came into picture. And the, the kind of the science that is practiced today systematically has its origin in Greece and later sort of spread in Europe. But for a very long time, it had actually was sort of in the back burner in a way. But there is a period in history and people call it as a dark medieval age. There was a, almost like 1,000 to 1,500 years of time. There was really hardly any uh, major uh, you know, academic discoveries happened. Although in India, we still continue to produce fantastic mathematics, astronomy, and so forth in 18th, 8th century, 9th century, and so forth. But the, the, the European science, the, the way it is being practiced now globally, adds its renaissance time. It has, it was sort of had a re-origin or, or a call a rebirth, if you want to call that way. And, and during the same time when, you know, the European Renaissance period, art, culture, science, music, everything sort of uh, uh, is a flourished. And that's the time some of the major discoveries were and, and the, you know, the, the how to make the knowledge production completely unbiased, how to make, how to develop the system of validation, verification of knowledge so that we leave out, you know, anything that is unbiased, uh, you know, which is not as a verified knowledge. 
when we talk about unbiasedness or you know verified knowledge i'm not talking about simply 100 people sitting together and and looking at the what is biased and unbiased because all of us could be biased simply because not because of deliberation not because of lack of understanding lack of you know expertise in logic or mathematics it's simply because we are born with certain limitations of what we can see how we can see how much we can see right we certain wavelength of light we can see certain wavelengths we cannot see certain you know kind of sound we can hear but certain ultrasonic we can't hear for example radio waves we can't hear directly whereas you know you know certain kinds of size we can uh, you know resolve you know certain size we cannot resolve distance wise everything so that's where you need technology which helps us to see things which ourselves can't see ourselves even if all the 7 billion people are you know got to get want to get together and try to discover something in a very unbiased way it will be still human biased is simply because human brain is involved in this so that's where technology also helps all the technology can have another you know it can also be developed with the help of science but technology helps also the pursuit of science for example telescope helped us to see things much better and better understanding of the universe microscope helped us to see better understanding of the microscopic the world so that way the the kind of science in addition to developing this technology it also helped us to understand our own limitation so even today there can be uh, i mean there are multiple ways of pursuit of science without using those technology right even today many scientists do what's called theoretical science they may not want to use any of this technology they may still use only their logic mathematics some people use computation some people use data science and large number of us also use experimental science with the help of technology so all of these things put together we are down evolved uh, a set of methods called scientific methodology but the basic fundamental you know concept remains the same that you pursue the knowledge in a very unbiased way and knowledge is considered as knowledge unless you know only when it is verified and validated using certain processes of science which are not get into the detail it's too much uh, you know today for that you know for the time that we have <clears throat> but at the same time it's also important that knowledge is shared because it's not enough a few people trying to discover something and say they have discovered and everybody else should believe in it right it should be tested again and again in multiple time context and multiple space context so across the time and space you know scale any knowledge needs to be verified and validated again and again unless unless it's time tested and and it it cannot be used as uh, you know a body of knowledge which is considered as is close to what you call absolute truth and that requires participation of very large number of people and that's where we need to communicate knowledge to the larger audience when communicating lot is we wouldn't know whether that person is you know has sufficient expertise and understanding to comprehend something new we should not be even thinking in that way that's why now the reasons why we need to communicate knowledge to everybody so writing books right you know or using uh, giving lectures at all multiple ways we do scientists do this but writing books is the one which has a much larger scale uh, dissemination of knowledge right and um, you know the when the johannes gutenberg revolution happened it all not only we could communicate knowledge with the help of text in multiple copies to large longer distances in the shortest time possible and during those days it also for the first time in human history we could start transmitting the knowledge with the help of images rather than only the text which is which is also another you know important way of communication and of course now with the help of internet and other things we you know in real time exchange knowledge so now coming up to this point what i am trying to say is india was already very poised for any new innovation that can happen or any new method of knowledge production that we take up so while british started this higher education system in 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 19th century they were not necessarily interested that indians should start practicing science uh, uh, and and in a way the europeans are doing they wanted you know uh, the modern education uh, of the british style for having intermediaries between the british 
people who few numbers who are coming here uh, and, and and to govern this uh, the country and large number of people who you know uh, represent uh, Indian population and but work for the British government but obviously when they teach literature philosophy and science you know it also had uh, uh, you know like any other academic mind it opens up and we start thinking differently we start imbibing some new ideas new ways of pursuit of knowledge and so forth so the so-called modern science entered into India and and we are the very first one to adapt this kind of a modern science very quickly because we are already ready. In fact, more, large part of this more so-called modern science was already, you know, had Indian you know contribution to it. The the mathematics or uh, logic and philosophy, many things had already spread from India to other places and then came back. But there is still a very new version of so-called modern science that we talk about experimental science of Greek origin and the use of technology like microscope and telescope and so. On spectroscopy and so forth was somewhat new that you have to use technology to be unbiased in absolute way uh, was something which was imported from uh, from the western uh, countries okay and that's when we started uh, in a very big way uh, introducing science just a, a fun part side part is also the other contribution when british came to india was also contribution of violin to indian music you know it's amazing the why the way violin is you know used particularly in southern uh, south indian carnatic music many people think that you know as violin is so nicely you know adapted is as if you know violin is part of an indian origin is part of you know together it has you know evolved over time it's it's just about 200 year old in in indian music anyway and there are you know very different ways we introduce this uh, you know one but interestingly, what happens is when you start opening up your mind, you also start opening up, you know, your social mind and seeing that you start seeing iniquity, you start seeing, you know, the problems in the society. There are so many, you know, uh, you know, superstitious um, belief system which are actually detrimental to the society and uh, which may have evolved over time because lack of knowledge, not because of any deliberate vested interest is simply lack of knowledge and there are also many other things as uh, you know uh, uh, you know uh, very very disruptive uh, practices of india's civilization was following and some of those things also helped uh, you know uh, the modern education uh, helped to remove some of them but at the same time the the injustice um, of a british rule of india was also was very evident when people actually studied you know the british legal system british philosophy british democracy and so forth and they could see that democracy is such a nice thing to talk about but it is not being practiced here in india right so that itself also helped in raising indian nationalism so some of the almost every why why one some of them almost every major freedom fighter or social reformers of 19th and 20th century were actually studied in british education system and and they also led started their own new uh, education or even research organizations you can see here indian association cultivation of science by raman did his work it was actually started in 1876 in the in the middle of the indian uh, uh, sorry british rule in india right so you know so many other institutions were also started they all started contributing to not only to the science also to the societal problem with the help of science and in Indi after independence, uh, the very first prime minister, Jawaharlal Nehru, had a lot, a huge uh, confidence that science and technology will help solve many, many problems and also bring in equity in the society, right? And, and so, he, you know, at that time, he and several other uh, great leaders, one of them is, of course, um, uh, uh, Maulana uh, uh, Abdul Kalam Azad, Azad Kalam, he was the education minister, you know, invested a lot of his time and efforts in setting up, you know, new education institutions, particularly like, you know, universities and IITs and so forth. A large number of research institutions were set up at the same time. And you can see some of them are set up and, you know, Indian, you know, uh, science and technology uh, sort of 
started expanding into the whole country, even to the smaller towns uh, during those time in up to, um, you know, in the last 50, 60 years, in the first 50, 60 years of India. So what's the outcome of it? Many of these are stories are known. That's why I'm talking about just put it as a, you know, uh, known stories, not necessarily less known stories. Self-sufficiency in food, India was importing food, India was being donated food by other countries in the 1950s and 60s. Now we are the largest producer of food. We are the largest exporter of food uh, to the world, right? We ourselves start donating to many other needy countries. And that basically is direct outcome of people who are doing basic science in genetics and leading to development of new uh, crop varieties. And of course, and all other people got together. It's a multidisciplinary approach. The agronomy, soil science, chemistry, physics people, then the data science people, though the data sciences have to be done with the help of pen and paper and using mathematics, not so much using the computational methods, what we do now. But still, they all got together and there was a support from the political government and also large number of economics also supported this whole initiative, finally led to what's called Green Revolution. In technology wise, so it's AAC, one of the lead institutions, and of course, is the one of the oldest institution of this kind in India. And they also helped in developing so many new programs for Indian post-independent India, like DAE was set up, ISRO was set up, DST, DBT were all set up for con developing uh, Indian science and technology ecosystem. And IST is all you know, it's sort of strength behind the modern economy. It's also a symbol of India's confidence in modern science and technology. And these were set up in 1950s and 60s with the benefit of all I, the IITs, we started reaping the full you know, benefit in the 80s onwards. In fact, some of the, the greatest um, contributors to world of science and technology came from IITs and IAC and some of our universities because we had far many students who could contribute to science and technology than what India can support as a nation, which was still a very poor nation in 1970s and 80s. Many of them actually started working outside in the country. They are the ones who have contributed to both to the world of science and technology and also to Indian science and technology somewhat indirectly. You know, all these Microsoft, Intel, IBM, and some of these big IT companies, whether it's hardware or software, are led by Indians. Even today, they are led by Indians. And they contributed directly and indirectly to, to India because many of the uh, the, the MNCs to come to India, one of the main reasons for them is they have seen, you know, a few thousand people what they could do in, in, in Silicon Valley. They were looking, thinking that India has millions of such people. Why don't we set up in India itself, you know, a Microsoft, in India itself, or Google or Intel or, you know, uh, an IBM. So it's not that simply, you know, the IT industry came to India. It's, the MNCs came to India as a big, a big investment. In fact, every one IT person that an MNC hires and sets up a shop in India, there'll be at least 10 people get jobs because of the ancillary support system. That's how IT industry is contributing to Indian economy. And this is some of the direct output of investing in education and both in science and technology um, early in 50s and 60s. And green revolution, I already spoke about. This is the some evidence about how much production we had and how much we have now and how much we are, you know, the other things. I'll come to that few of the less known thing, which has not only solved the, some of the Indian problems, it is also a global contribution. Recently, um, you know, um, uh, Dilip Malinobis uh, was awarded uh, posthumously uh, Padma Vibhushan, as you all have heard about him now because of that award, but he died you know, unfortunately, about three, four years, three, four months earlier than that. And until he died and his name came up in the newspaper, most of us had forgotten his name. Obviously, you know, the, that's why the, the award came posthumously and not when he was still, you know, alive. And his contribution, it's, everybody thinks that what is, you know, it's about the oral rehydration, right? What he made was many of the problem of, you know, diarrhea or any of that kind of problem, particularly, you know, in, in places where water can be, you know, problem. Uh, there's another uh, interest, similar kind of, uh, you know, one is you combine sugar and salt, right? You had to keep certain kind of osmotic, uh, you know, balance. And you also had to ensure that there is movement of, you know, salt inside and outside. 
and giving some sugar along with the salt helps because of the the, the you know every cell is a is 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 a living organism in itself the entire bioenergetics happens inside a single cell we may have be about 50 trillion cells in our body but the energy that is required for all our activities whether i'm running or i'm lifting 100 kilograms right that atp that is required the chemical energy which finally is gets converted to mechanical energy that atp is generated in individual cells it is there is no one big centralized energy production system in the body but what happens is if i can do more things compared to a, a sim simple single cell organism is simply because large number of cells work in synchrony right so large number of cells like muscle cells work in synchrony so it's very important that we understand that cell biology we understand how the the osmotic balance is maintained and how energy is taken up by individual cells from outside energy how it gets converted into um, you know metabolic uh, in, through metabolism to some usable form of chemical energy or mechanical energy and this process of understanding is what made him to you know develop this simple method which has now we need very all of us use this regularly whenever some problem comes and uh, you know and it has saved millions and millions of people all over the world and same thing you know uh, professor ramalinga swami um, who is uh, uh, one of the founders of icmr indian you know uh, council of medical research and he's made a very simple you know again a lot of work has gone into it but the outcome is looks very simple very elegant you know that's how we should look at the simplicity has elegance in it right for example he said he, enormous amount of work he did suggest that that there is lack of iodine in indian you know uh, you know uh, the, the nutrition that we uh, take up through the food and in our uh, you know because of this there is you know a you know, large number of you know uh, early childhood blindness in indian population the only way we can reduce this by giving uh, iodized salt uh, you know as part of our daily intake and uh, as you may see all of you you know you may you whenever you go and you want to buy an iodized salt you don't buy simply sodium chloride right and so there can be you know you know the natural salt that we use sometime can be iodized sometime may not be iodized we wouldn't know unless it is empirically verified so now it's you know any seller of salt you know they have to ensure whether it is iodized or not it can be fortified out from you know externally or it could be naturally some iodine may be present along with the sodium chloride so this is you know another major contribution again all of these discoveries were implemented at such a large scale in indian context which also helped immediately to be implemented in other smaller countries where they didn't have their own such a technology base because you know there are 200 plus countries in this world now science and technology is still in only in a limited number of countries in a very systematic way we do this pandemic helped you know with basically an evidence of it large number of countries is not necessarily based on the population size similarly even countries which had more than 100 million people many of them didn't have rt pcr you know uh, testing labs many of them didn't have a way of producing any kind of pharmaceutical drugs or vaccines so we had they had to depend from outsiders so sir shamuna de uh, i'm again and many of you uh, some of you may have heard large number of you know general public they would not have heard and uh, you know and he is the one who identified what is the toxin that is present in the bacteria which causes the the symptoms when there is a cholera you know uh, is uh, the, the, we we suffer with cholera again his discovery over time led to understanding that one way to treat is of course using certain kinds of antibiotics of this against the cholera bacteria or certain kinds of drugs against the cholera bacteria not antibiotic it could be non antibiotic you know other drugs or to reduce the symptom another simple method he, you know he proposed is simply over another oral rehydration because of you know one of the thing that happens when this toxicity builds up because of the infection is we lose water and uh, and simple oral rehydration therapy is something which he also proposed and uh, you know which again help to you know 
save people. Because one of the things what happens here is we all have a very good immune system to fight infection. We have two types of immune system, innate immunity and adaptive immunity. And most of the early uh, response with the help of innate immunity, particularly almost all bacterial infections is for, and fought with the help of innate immunity. They make certain kinds of peptides and try to kill the bacteria. But the production of, you know, if the, if the infection is very high, the production of, uh, you know, the peptides um, to kill the bacteria may not be enough, or it may take certain time, a certain amount of time to build the, you know, the, all the defense system of the of the our own immune system. And what oral rehydration helps is actually also buying some time, not necessarily the, is the curative, right? It also helps in buying some time so that our own immune system will take over rather than taking again some more antibiotic and which will also have other problems later, um, you know, like antimicrobial resistant you know, uh, infection may start uh, affecting us. Now, again, uh, in the context of Amul, I'm sure all of you know Amul's story. And there is no day we, you know, if anybody would read any newspaper, there will always be a nice uh, cartoon from Amul, um, but you know that reminds us about Amul and its quality and everything. Amul is sort of is also synonymous of scale and quality, both amount of milk that is pooled and made in different products, and the quality of the products and supply to the you know not only India to and also export to many countries. But there are also you know what people don't know is there are a couple of very interesting technological improvisation with the help of basic science, people already had knowledge of basic science behind it. They could very quickly come out with. One of them is, you know, Indian, large part of Indian milk production is based with, you know, you know because of the buffalo dairy and not, uh, you know, the cows, right? So the, 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 the baby milk powder, which is a major part of the nutrition for children, for mothers who, who are deprived of nutritious food and because of which they cannot give uh, you know, uh, milk to the babies, the baby milk powder is a major source of uh, you know, uh, nutrition, the food itself. And uh, we couldn't make baby milk powder when Amul was, um, was trying, it's simply because the buffalo milk is more fatty and almost all the baby milk powder making machines were developed in Denmark or in, uh, in, uh, in Netherlands, they were all you know, were using for the cow milk. CFTRI in Mysore, Central um, Food and Technology Research Institution, they developed a technology, but first they understood the very different aspect of the chemistry of the, the milk and very different lipids that are present. And based on that, they actually thought of what should be the temperature, what should be the pressure, what should be the, 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 the concentration of, you know, nitrogen gas in the system to make sure that we can make baby milk powder from the buffalo milk and they successfully made it and then Mamul started making baby milk powder from buffalo milk in 1970s. Another major innovation is um, uh, using these plastic sachets, low density polyethylene sachets, which the we, until then we, we remember we were all used to get milk in bottles and uh, it could only be delivered to a shorter distances. You can't send it to longer distances. And, uh, and also storage will become a problem, uh, particularly in the refrigerator and kind of thing. Refrigeration itself was not so much, uh, you know, in practice in 70s and 80s. So if you can get milk in the morning, that's the this, and they will not be able to get the milk in the evening. So in the absence of good nutritious food, which milk is the major source of nutrition, and our performance in sports, our performance in other kinds of work, everywhere there was some limitation because we, we cannot, you know, you know, ask, people with the low uh, BMI and you know, low muscle power to participate in many of these kind of things. At the same time, cognitive ability is also largely dependent on how much nutritious food you be, uh, children get early during childhood. So, okay. So in that context, supplying milk to the doorstep of people at any time of the day uh, was important so that children get nutritious. They get their nutrition. So developing this sachet was done by chemists of that time, and uh, you know, um, and and uh, Professor Shivram, who is currently at NCL, and his and Professor Varadkar was a 
one of the presidents of the Indian National Press Academy. And uh, they're all team. They got together and actually developed these sachets. And not only they developed which should be the right chemicals to make this sachet, and also how to fill in, uh, how to fill pasteurized milk in that sachet. So that for 24 to 36 hours, it will stay without any problem. Plant tissue culture is another area which is a trillion dollar uh, kind of a business now all over the world. It has helped many, many countries, many, many places. Unfortunately, India itself lost on the business aspect of plant tissue culture, although we are now one of the largest users of this technology. It came out of the basic science that was being done in the Botany University. Uh, some of the famous botanists, many of the academic people may remember their name, Panchanan Maheshwari and Johiri and his, and his students and colleagues, younger colleagues. But that Botany Department of Delhi University is this, the one which seeded that entire process of plant tissue culture in 19, early late 50s and 60s, which led to what we call as plant tissue culture now, and which is you know, a huge um, industry. Another interesting story, which, you know, look at all of these people. You know, the children always think that they have a certain image of who is the scientist. Scientists, they have an image of Einstein is a scientist. Scientist Raman is a scientist always looking through the microscope or doing something or thinking something, or writing mathematical equations on a piece of paper and kind of thing. Any of these people who you see on the street, you don't consider them as scientists. But each one of them have contributed in such a way, it has saved millions of people. India was, you know, didn't have blood bags. As you all know, in 1960s and 70s, blood transfusion, if someone reached blood because of accident, lost a lot of blood, one way to give blood is to bring the donor and connect the pipe from the donor to the receiver directly. That's what I'm sure many of you have seen in the films, uh, how the blood transfusion is to be done on those days. But blood bag is the one where you can collect the blood, store it, and give it to the person at, at a time when it is required immediately. The second is you can also test the blood before you give it, whether the person is HIV infected or not, or all those things, you can test all of these things, or you can keep in the blood bank good quality blood for a long time and uh, in large quantity so that needy people can be given during, during surgery or because of accident if whenever you have to give blood back. Uh, India was, you know, was very difficult to import such large number of blood back given our population size. And uh, see Chitra Tirunal, scientist and, uh, you know, one uh, IS officer who retired and uh, not, he resigned from the job and started his own, you know, those days they were never called as startup. Now we call them a start startup started a small company in collaboration with Sitra and Irunal, and they started making blood bag in a smaller one, became a big hit. A lot of innovation had to do it. It's not only about the material, it's also about kind of needle use, the kind of, uh, you know, how to, you know, uh, you know, what kind of tubing you have to use, what kind of, uh, con you know, the, you know, the knobs and everything you have to use in it, you know, to control the flow and everything. It's all, a lot of science was done. And you have to test the blood again and again to make sure that what you are collecting and what you are storing is of quality, which can be used for transfusion. And the, all that, this work took some time. And now India is not only making blood bags, of course, there are many more companies make. For the entire country of 1.5 billion people, we are exporting to close to about 80 countries blood bags from, from India. I'm sure, again, you have heard about Professor Acharya Ray in multiple different Name ways his name comes, including in the freedom struggle, is one of the great thinkers also of that time. And uh, you know, he used to, as a, even as an undergraduate student, he used to think a lot about what should be the kind of society we should live in. You know, what kind of democracy we should have, why we should have British in, in our country, and kind of thing. Even in eighties, you know, uh, late eighteen hundreds, nineteenth century. But the entire pharmaceutical industry, which we have taken full benefit now, the the we get highest quality medicine of a much low cost only in India. No country can provide this kind of a healthcare, best healthcare at such low cost. Of course, we still have inequality. Large number of people can't access good healthcare is because of other socioeconomic reasons and not necessarily because of our poor in science and technology. And when vaccine, we, you know, within one year, we could give three doses to 1.5 billion people or at least, you know, billion people. It's because of the pharmaceutical industry, which has developed over the last 30, 40 years, and it's contributed immensely. We are ready to launch a new drug or new vaccine at a scale and at, a, at a, such an affordable cost very easily. 
there is another interesting story which is amazing story for me it's a for people who are players are still working in india contributing in indian science some of you main academic people may know the names which is here again look at those people no one consider them you know traditional way they are scientist because we have an image of a scientist uh, which is different from from the way they look here so ramesh santu is on the on the uh, on the on on your right he um, is a basic biologist trying to understand what happens when in in when a bacteria infects plants and how the plants respond and what bacteria would do in response to that response right so obviously it's like a you know back and forth uh, you know fighting between uh, a pathogen and its host is a bad price in this he was using but he his understanding of this work led him to think that there must be a way of you know controlling this if we bring three or four different mechanism of resistance or fighting the bacteria in the same plant and it wasn't know whether it's such, such a thing or present so he started looking around very different old rice germplasm collection what we call wild rice and other things and found out that there are actually they do present either a combination of one or two not necessarily all three in the same you know one so he started you know collaborating with plant breeders in uh, in hyderabad uh, and uh, and that basically led to development of a new variety at uh, what call as improvised samba masuri and this is now grown in close to about 300000 hectares in particular in coastal andhra not only it has improved the income of the farmers it has reduced the use of you know chemical uh, uh, method of treating the uh, killing the bacterial pathogen at the same time it has saved many lives not only because of improved livelihood it's also because you know in india one of the craziest problem we have is the farmer suicide even if 10 or 100 farmers have you know this work has prevented the farmers to go get an extreme of going to in suicide uh, taking up the suicide uh, uh, as a solution to their problem uh, it's it's a bigger contribution to the society and that's the what these people have done an amazing work similarly we have a lot of interesting work i think I, how much time do i have uh, professor gover because i think take at least 15 minutes more okay and i'll try no i'll take maybe five more five to 10 minutes and then i'll because we can uh, then wind up yeah so you know vasmati right we all eat so, you know some people eat every day some of us eat once in a while on certain occasions but you know ethnic basmati coming from you know this uh, you know himalayan uh, you know certain regions it's it has a big you know attraction and you know the you know uh, there's a big market too and uh, there's because of this there are also a lot of adulteration used to happen and uh, many european countries and which were importing basmati from india they say no we don't want to import anything because it's all adulterated we want that you know specific region basmati or authentic basmati from specific region that is the uh, the you know uttarakhand you know some parts of uttarakhand so the the basic work that was being done in ccmb and cdft uh, and which led to dna fingerprinting for its forensic and other purposes and they initially thought all they were they're doing is mostly related to uh, human or at the most with few other animals but when when the some uh, it was it came from the from uh, rice export authority they were he came forward and say can you do this for us can you use dna fingerprinting to identify authentic basmati so that we can stamp every bag of basmati it goes from india saying that it is dna fingerprint authenticated which is the best technology you can think of high resolution high most reliable technology and so the scientist in the two places they actually develop a technology where even this kind of a barcoding can be done for plant swans so now the every batch of basmati rice that is exported gets a stamp that it is verified with the help of this so called uh, dna fingerprinting which is uh, as i told you the most advanced and reliable technology for this kind of purposes and which has improved now export which again improved the income to the farmers it has collected large number of amount of you know tax for india so for the what 5 to 10 crore rupees of investment the scientists made during this development indian government is collecting 
at least 500 crore per year in taxes, export taxes, right? Think of it, how much is the contribution to the society because of, you know, the fund that is being generated. But of course, scientists didn't get anything, not even an award for this. They, you know, uh, they're working, of course, they are, I don't think they are regretting, they're not even expecting anything. But they're completely unknown to most of you uh, in the audience. I'll, I'll skip the IT revolution again. IT revolution is a huge, you know, you know, but you don't know the players of IT revolution. You would know the benefit of IT revolution. Every day we are benefiting from this. Our life has changed completely. Our income status has completely changed completely, right? And in the last uh, 30 years since the liberalization in 1981. But, you know, very interesting, irrespective of how it started, but you look at it in one of the things here happened. TF, uh, sorry, amongst the, all the initial, um, you know, by the way, first four, com three computers which came to India were a donation to India. The fourth computer, Government of India bought it. The fourth computer that was bought went to IIT Kanpur. IIT Kanpur is one of the first to start a BTEC in computer science. It's uh, maybe the second in the world or so, or third in the world, if I'm correct. I think the Caltech was the first one. And uh, one other one in the maybe you know, not the east coast of US, another one in the west coast is tough. I think India may be the third or, or so or the second or the third to start the BTEC. Maybe Professor Timurti would know. What what this happened was that you just started generating the human resources to use the computers, develop the technology, develop the software, and develop new methods of you know applications of computers, right? That has led to huge change, not only India, for the whole world, the entire revolution, you know, happened, right? So it, many times, you know, what you want to do today and what is the benefit of which many times, you know, you don't know whether you're really ahead of time or so. People always say that, you know, I was ahead of time, no one accepted my, you know, idea kind of thing. Sometimes with, with conviction, we should just go ahead and do it, you know, and sometimes it may fail it, sometimes it may, you know, work out. But it works out, it can have a, you know, disruptive change to the whole world. That's exactly what happened uh, when computer science was introduced as an undergraduate program in IIT Kanpur in 1960s. So, as you can see here, a lot of investment was made in education, science and technology um, since independence. And that basically led the whole generation of our confident Indians, which basically led when 1991 economic the political decision was taken to open up the economy, right? There was a quantum change that happened uh, immediately because we were ready to for a change. If 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 liberal if liberalization happened in 1970s, I don't think it would have had the same impact. It's simply because we were not ready yet. Uh, it takes at least a few years, you know, uh, decades to reach to that stage. But finally, we reached thanks to conviction that science and technology, I'm not talking about science and technology in one word, science and technology are two different things. Science helps developing technology, technology helps doing better science. A combination of both are important for the society. Now, again, I'll not go into the details, you just read this. It always goes up to the grassroots level, it up to the school education level. Again, when I talk about science and technology, when I talk about unknown stories of Indian science, it's also that unknown teachers of Indian science are also equally important. Because finally, we are all human beings. What we are doing is because of we learn from other human beings. And teachers are the most important component of this process. So when you talk about science and technology landscape, we have to include science teachers in this landscape. This rocket, I'm, I don't know how many of you can recognize, this is the jumbo rocket we used uh, to to launch 103 satellites in one in one launch. I mean, to place 103 satellites in one launch, and this is a landmark, you know, uh, in Indian science and technology history. The reason is, if you look at the whole world is looking at us, and what we are showing them is we can do this. If you can do this, you can do many more things, right? In number of times you you try to convince that you know you invest in India you know you know you we will work with with together with globally we can actually take up global challenges lead the sol solution to the global challenges India can be considered as one of them we can only irrespective of how much talk we do 
one such accomplishment would change the perception of the whole world about India and Indians, right? And that's one of the things that happened just about five years ago when we launched this rocket and it placed 103 satellites in one go. It was the first to, uh, you know, for India to do it, anything such a large number. I mean, it is the first one in the world to do it in India. And I'm sure you also worked on Mars Arbiter, uh, where the, you know, how successful it was. But anyway, we should not be too complacent. We should not be too nationalistic. We should not be too isolationist in this world. 21st century is global. Every point on earth is connected and we are working together and we are sharing knowledge and everything. We can't say this is because we generated this. It's simply that everybody has contributed to knowledge production. You know, as Newton said, if I could see father because I was standing on the shoulders of giant, it's the reason because he was working on the prior knowledge of many other people who already had contributed. Some are known, some are unknown. Right. And then you could only improvise the knowledge. Similarly, all the things that we do is, you know, last 3000 years of knowledge production history has gone into it. And obviously, everybody has contributed it globally. Some are directly, some are indirectly, some are no names, some are unknown names, large number of their unknown names. So, and it, we are now, you know, one con global community. In fact, if you look at the human history uh, evolution, we started a small community in Eastern Africa and then migrated out and made so many different communities. Now, with the help of modern technology, we are still we are still living in different parts of the earth. We are made speak different languages, have different cultures, but we are connected now. We are one community. And this one community can solve the bigger problems, but requires local solution. So, for example, climate change can have different impact in different parts of the countries, different parts of the regions, different parts of the world. Pandemic could be a global problem. It may manifest differently, slightly different in different parts of the world. Even non-pharmaceutical intervention may have to be different for different parts of the world. Pharmaceutical intervention also can be different, maybe different in different parts of the world. So, so you need strengths of the local science and technology community but it should be connected to the global community. We cannot only work on our own and try to solve all the problems. And in that context, working together with the rest of the world is very, very important. This lesson that we learn from COVID is the best example. I, you know, every day, information used to be put up on the internet through you know, reliable resources or sometimes through unreliable resources like YouTube. People shared everything. And that helped us to quickly identify RT-PCR based method of, you know, identification and separation and isolation and non pharmaceutical intervention like lockdown. We also went into, you know, very few different other ways of controlling the infection or reducing the symptoms and also um, developing the new drugs and the vaccines, right? And which basically made the pandemic uh, passe, uh, you know, in the human history uh, rather than you know, bringing too much of a disruptive change. It has, of course, has unfortunately had had really disruptive change to the world, uh, human society, but still uh, we have come out, a uh, large number of us have come out um, okay because of contribution of science and technology. And also the fact that the whole world unconditionally shared information uh, without any problem. And in real time, sorry. In Indian context, there are a large number of unknown people have worked together. We started with two testing centers in the beginning, and we actually during the Delta wave had to close about 12,000 RT PCR testing centers, a large number of science and technology people, scientists, students, science students, and they all contributed to this RT PCR test. And um, we actually produced you know RT PCR kits because even couldn't import. We didn't have even reagents locally produced like DNTPs in India. We had to start even thinking how to make DNTPs and use it for the purpose of diagnostic. It was supposed to be high quality at a high scale. Started with uh, no indigenous kits to making almost a million kits per day to build the capabilities. From close to about 2,000 rupees per test to less than 50 rupees per test 
uh, of the kit cost now we have achieved and of course you know the vaccines that is developed and almost all of us have three doses of vaccine so with all of these things we have to make sure that basic science should spread more in india and should be connected to societal problems and and so that we can improve the knowledge at the same time also apply the knowledge to solve real life problems there should be more rnd non governmental sector it should not be only government dependent because you know participation non government because they are the ones who conceive many times ideas better and also make it sustainable solution because feasibility of any solution should be such that you know it's marketable affordable and uh, you know uh, and also it should be able to deploy it across the you know you know geoclimatic situation so it's very important involve non government sector and you know education also we need to make our scientists and student more adaptable in a fast changing world in you know all of us who were in this age now we lived in a time where for a decade nothing used to change much right we could do day every day exactly the same thing morning go for a walk come back and do what your routine for 10 years 15 years could have the same routine but things have changed so much now our our young people cannot have the same routine because of fast changing world international science is very important otherwise we would not have been solved the problem of you know covid 19 same time to solve bigger problem like climate change internationalization is extremely important all of this requires open access uh, to information and data right so by by pursuit of science by better understanding of what science can do to the society we all can imbibe the essence of science and which is again helps in building what's called scientific temperament which also has immediate societal benefit to reduce the conflict and improve the the harmony in the society i'll stop here thank you very much so thank you professor shashi wonderful yeah very nice thank you thank you excellent so exposition so his lecture is now open for comments and questions oh yeah i think i took 5 minutes longer than no no it's okay that's perfectly fine it was quite absorbing so uh i got to talk to okay was it satyamurti no it was a it was a beautiful lecture i have it's no i have no specific question to shashi other than to say that i really enjoyed and i enjoyed his message that he uh, he conveyed throughout the lecture you know sometimes people say that we have not done science a reason yes, i think it was i think it was the i think it was the spsti forum where somebody said science is to be blamed for everything all the problems <laughs> i said i said you don't have to listen to it just because he is saying it just refute it refute it saying the science is, has put us where we are and uh, shashi has uh, put in front of us very eloquently how we as a nation uh, came out of famine came out of disease came out of cholera and so on today we are whether how you defend superpower is a different matter uh, today we are a beacon of hope for uh, particularly for what they call the southern uh, part of the yeah. globe i i congratulate shashi for conveying this uh, message and i also like i i like you saying this has to go across to the people that science has put us where we are today in india in terms of the global map thank you shashi it is really wonderful thank you thank you so before i invite uh, dr jitendra kaur arora whom we have specially invited to share her thoughts uh, on this lecture and there are some comments which are people have put in the chat box which you can read and in particular there is a question what are what are your thoughts on people saying brain drain okay brain drain so i i'll yeah. answer this yeah, yeah. so uh, you know this is something which we always hear i always already answered to some extent mm -hmm. clearly when it comes to science and technology it's global 
and you know many times we cannot contribute to science in in simply that any part of the world is you know conducive to any particular area of science certain kinds of science you can do only if there is a critical number of certain you know uh, you know uh, scientists of that particular area of work are in one place right so sometimes we go and want to work in princeton or harvard or some kind of a place so that it's easy for us to you know contribute to science the way we want to contribute there's nothing wrong in it second is i already gave you the example of it industry right the it industry the whole world developed in india is the largest beneficiary of india and china which are the large you know close to about 3 billion people put together more than 3 billion and uh, the largest beneficiary of it revolution which is all seeded by a small number of people who actually went out why why did they go because you know we trained them in computer science in 1960s and there were no computers except in six different places right when we had 60 let's say computer science engineers what will they do but they could contribute to the growth of it industry in the western country and then brought back you cannot blame them that they were you know didn't you know could they have built intel and ibm in india simply because they were in india and you know what could they have done it you would have lost in the ocean of people who you know not been able to contribute they would have lived for themselves in some way could they have contributed to change of the world why do you want to expect that you work for india all the time the world is this world of science because whatever we learn has been contributed by people who built pyramids to people who built china wall to people who made indian mathematics so famous so we contribute back to the world and we all benefit india benefited and the world benefited so i'm okay with anybody working anywhere there is nothing like brain drain is only our our imagination there is nothing like brain drain professor jairo would you like to join professor jairo singh professor jairo you can unmute yourself yes i have no specific comment to make except to tell that i enjoyed the talk very much and uh, what you know many people propagate that the science did nothing in india and why should they be spending more money i think this should be eye opening for them what actually science has done for india and it justifies very well why the science should be funded more in india than what the the cuts in the research are being made so it should be eye opening for them that we need still need lot of pumping of money into the scientific research in india thank you i really enjoyed the talk thank you there is a comment uh, shashi it says it was a great talk so good to hear about unsung superstars of science and how it has contributed immensely to society considering global urgent challenge like global warming looming us it may be important for some more scientists to do outreach and work with local community how can science outreach be scaled with quality this is posed to you so uh, how can uh, science it, outreach yeah so you have you know, been engaged in it at ashoka you have been engaged in it at pune yeah. and now i mean you can lead it at bangalore you know sure sure the I'm, fr I'm platform not, i'm passionate huh? about it so science outreach uh, of course you know the you know money is of course uh, doing some research on people how they you know uh, actually be able to contribute the way contribute right so what are the different conditions in which they work for example the shamnath day or uh, or uh, you know um, uh, you know dilip mahanobis how did they actually able to you know come out with these solutions what kind of you know understanding they had in the beginning was the based on the work they did how, what new understanding they have obtained how did they do it what was the level of confidence they had in 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 this kind of a solution and then the pr process is very important and one has to do research and then communicate that widely using all kinds of media and these days modern media is very very effective but we have to make sure that we communicate truly as scientists and not to glorify anything 
So we have to be very honest in what we communicate. And that's important. Otherwise, science communication will fall. You know, within three to four years, people will see lots of, you know, fake information or uh, unverified information. And then people lose confidence in science. So when we communicate science, we have to be extremely careful. It's as important as practicing science. Mm -hmm. It's equally important that we follow the same integrity and ethics of science when we practice science, which also we used in science communication. So we have with us Dr. Jitinder Kaur Arora, the Executive Director of Punjab State Council of Science and Technology. Can I and yes, Professor Dua, before. Mm -hmm. Yes, Professor Shashi, it was one of the best uh, lectures in which we went through the album of the people, of the men who changed the world, especially in India, and brought a silent revolution, which is apparent these days. This album is too unique to be kept as on, on the, you know, in the libraries as well as in the classrooms. But somehow I was missing the two names. One was that of Narendra Singh Kepi, and the second was that of F.C. Kul. In fact, Narendra Singh, Sorry. Kapani. N.S. Kapani. N.S. Kapani. He was of he was given Padam Babushan two years back. Last year he died and was offered the scientific advisors post to Government of India in 1947 by Pandit Nehru only. And so was FC Kohli also, who brought the IT revolution. In case my request is that in case you add these two names also in this album, it will glorify it. It will it will enhance the beauty of this album first. That's my request. Thanks. So being Thank a biologist sort of, uh, you know, more, <laughs> you know, sort of easier for me to pick up some stories from biology. There are many, many more studies outside biology, I'm sure. One of them is, of course, in, you know, Punjab University, I think, has was the first accelerator in the, in the country, I think, or in this part of the world. Yes. Uh, yeah. Other than the um, US and Europe, First accelerated in Asia came to Punjab University. I think they were the ones to set up and used for undergraduate teaching. Some of the great businesses came out of PAU because of the accelerator they had. And Professor M.S. Randava played a major role in this scientific <laughs> program. So thank you, Professor Dua. So may thank I now invite Dr. Jitendra Kar Kar Arora, Arora for her comments. Uh, thank you, <laughs> Thank you for having me here. And so to the, uh, Dr. Kia, I think you're uh, you are unmuted. Yeah. So thank you for having me here. Uh, one can hardly comment on anything. I think we were spellbound listening to Professor Shashi. Uh, so Dr. Dua made a comment, and uh, you know would like to. And also Dr. Shashi said, uh, you know, there is elegance in simplicity. And he beautifully picked up uh, very simplistic examples. And uh, the whole lecture was so flowy with the elegance. You know? So Dr. Kapani, Narendra Singh Kapani, you mentioned Dr. Dua. So perhaps all the students who are here uh, today on this forum of SPSTI I would like to uh, start from there that uh, fiber optics, the discovery that he brought on board from, uh, I think, 1988 to 2000, that led to replacement of all the copper cables with the, the optic fibers. Mm -hmm. Because the speed at which the data could be transmitted was revolutionized because of uh, Narendra Singh Kampani. Yeah. And the other, other name that uh, came to my mind, uh, obviously, as uh, Dr. Shashi said, that there is a need for uh, building communities, you know, communities with conscious, well-informed communities at the local level. So talking of the sub-national perspective, uh, a few other thoughts that, a few other names that crop up in my mind. Uh, one is of uh, Dr. D.S. Atwal, 
the unsung heroes uh, dr d s atwal was the founder of department of plant breeding in punjab agriculture university and uh, and uh, the uh, variety uh, of wheat that he came up with uh, you know most popular amber grain wheat kalyan sona uh, you know that was his contribution and uh, you rightly mentioned uh, the, from the state of being uh, you know food insufficient nation to the nation which could supply uh food which could become a food surplus country you know i think these are uh, again huge contributions uh, talking of the unsung heroes from punjab i think dr professor arun grover is the best one to speak of those ruchiram sani for example 500 lectures he gave in 1885 you know and uh, taking community along building an informed conscious community um in fact many names are coming to my mind but i'll keep the comments very very short uh, uh today the state that we are in for example talking of the state of punjab we are when we talk of bicycle production punjab produces 80% of the bicycles produced in the country we talk of sports goods manufacturing 75% of total sports sports goods that are manufactured in india are manufactured in punjab thousand uh, hand tool manufacturing units so this all could become possible because um, it was in a cellular you beautifully said dr shashi that uh, you know india was the seat of knowledge and uh, that's how we could imbibe when the uh, you know at the british time the uh, a knowledge system a formal knowledge system was put in front of us we we could imbibe it so quickly because we had it already at our cellular level you know so a poem uh, 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 just two lines of uh, mathili sharan gupt's uh, book this is, book is called bharat bharati you know so just two lines that come to my mind after having listened to what you said he said sansar ko pehle hame ne gyan shiksha daan di aachar ki vyavhar ki vyapar ki vigyan ki so i think no denying that uh, you know how quickly we have come to from what the from bharat to modern india that we are today and again talking of uh, you know the state of punjab giving uh, quickly one example that we are the uh, this punjab is the highest tractor manufacturing state and uh, that is possible because the level of innovation it's known as enterprising uh you know people with lot of uh, you know jugaad in their uh, blood uh, but talking of say one industry mandra and mandra from punjab which is the highest patent filer company also from punjab one tractor uh, product that they came up with it's called code more than 100 patents have gone into making that one product so that the level of that's the level of innovation Uh, that the companies have here um, i think beautiful uh, i'm falling short of words having having uh, listened to such a mesmerizing effect that you left on all of us and um, one request that perhaps you could share the uh, the uh, you know your presentation with spsti and uh, spsti can further disseminate to all the various possible forums that can strengthen the uh, science outreach uh, activities uh, also happy to share with you uh, dr shashi and all present here that we've just started a very unique program which is in line with the the thought process that you have that that let's talk about the unsung heroes let's take and as dr satyamurthy rightly said let's take pride in where we are not glorifying but let's take right pride in where we have taken the country 
So we very recently started a program called Grassroots Innovators of Punjab. It is, uh, we've conceptualized in collaboration with National Innovation Foundation of BST Government of India, wherein we are encouraging the grassroots inno innovators, be it farmers, be it artisans, be it small time mechanics, who have come up with these small innovations which have a potential to make a large impact. So this, uh, uh, you know, I would like to also take this opportunity to, to share that the call is still open. In fact, 7th March is the last date and uh, we're getting overwhelming response. And uh, the idea is that let's take, uh, let's celebrate these unsung heroes at the grassroots level and provide them all the facilitation that is required, maybe for IP protection, maybe for scaling up their ideas and so on and so forth. Uh, I think that's all that comes to my mind. And while, uh, yeah, another thought that came to my mind when we talk of uh, food security, uh, since, I taught, since I studied and then uh, served also in PAU, uh, three uh, out of the total uh, 51 recipients of World Food Prize, nine came from uh, India and one third of those came from Punjab Agriculture University. Uh, uh, Professor Kush, I'm sure many of us know, 96, Surinder Kumar Vassal in 2000, Ratan Lal in 2020. So a brilliant idea. Congratulations to SPSTI. Professor Grover, thank you for having me here. A brilliant idea of, uh, uh, you know, conceptualizing this lecture the way it was. I think it will go a long way in inculcating scientific temper. Thank you. Thank you once again. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Professor Grover, you are you. You are muted. Thank you. Thank you, Jitenderji. So we have with us Professor R.K. Kohli, the president of Chandigarh chapter of NASI. In, in fact, NASI, our SPSTI platform is a success because uh, Professor Pasi, who was the predecessor of Professor Kohli, he mooted this idea that the SPSTI should organize these things in association with the Chandigarh chapters of the science academies. And this is how we have progressed from a small beginning. And Professor Kohli is with us, not only to propose a vote of thanks, you all, we are all aware that Professor Kohli himself is an eminent botanist and internationally renowned environmentalist amongst us. So we are very happy that whenever he has time, he is with us on our platform. And today he is with us to formally propose a vote of thanks and also offer his comments for today's lecture. Professor Kohli, please. Thank you, Professor Grover. Thanks for sparing to perform a very pleasant duty of proposing a vote of thanks. I believe you all will agree with me that the lecture on less known success stories of Indian science that transformed India, delivered by a successful scholar, visionary scientist, and science administrator, Professor L.S. Shashidhara, has been extremely good, gripping and revealing the unsung scientist whose simple work had elegant science and he also talked about the history of science in pre and post independence in India. You are right, sir. We are expected to nurture science and bring in scientific temper in the new generation. We all are privileged and so very proud of you, dear Dr. Shashi Dharan. On behalf of SPSTI, NASI, INYAS, INSA, and the PSCST. And on my own behalf, I express gratitude and a big thanks to you, sir. I wish, as a token of it, we all must, must give a round of applause 
in honor of the speaker for such a nice lecture. Thanks to our colleague, Dr. Rajat Sandhir, for nicely introducing Dr. Shashidhara. What a privilege, Dr. Rajat. Thanks to Dr. Jitendra Tarada and PSCST for supporting our activities. The credit for arranging such beautiful talks from the stalwarts in their respective fields goes to our dynamic team of Mr. Dharamvirji, Professor Arun Grover, Professor Kea. Thanks to them also. We are proud of you all. Thanks are also due to Ms. Rajani and Mr. Mahi Paul for the support behind the curtain. Normally, they are the unsung performers. Thanks to them both. Last but not the least, huge thanks to the participants of this interesting lecture, without whom there is no meaning of our efforts. Thanks to you all. Thank you so much. God bless us all. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Kohli. Thank you. So, Bye, everyone. Thank you very much. Thanks for having yeah. me here. Yeah, thank you. So I may just share with the audience our next lecture on the vision for CSR Institute of Microbial Technology will be delivered by the director, MTech, Professor Khosla, in a physical form. Actually, it will be in a hybrid mode broadcast from the from, from the auditorium of CSR Imtech mm -hmm. on the afternoon of March 14. So uh, it, time would be 3 p.m., but the details would be posted by Mahipalji and, <coughs> and Anuj Goel very soon. So see you all on 14th March. Afternoon. 14th March is which day? Is it? Well, I think it's a Wednesday. It's a Wednesday. Okay. It will be in hybrid mode. Okay. Okay. So thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thanks to all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent lecture. Good. It was a good dripping lecture. Thank you very much. Mr. Doctor Sir, Doctor Jairu. How are you? Nice to see you. Nice to see you too. Long time. Hello, Dr. Satyamurti. Perhaps